The verb maroon means to trap or isolate someone, usually in an inaccessible place, like an island. Robinson Crusoe was marooned, the passengers and crew of the SS Minnow were marooned. But the noun maroon is less well known. A maroon is an African in the Americas who escaped slavery and went on to form their own settlements, often with indigenous peoples, and their descendants. There were maroon communities across the Americas, from North Carolina to Brazil. They would deliberately choose isolated and inaccessible locations to form settlements that formed their own culture, and in some cases, their own languages. And the history of Maroons in the Americas is broad, but perhaps the most well-known are the Maroons of Jamaica, who still maintain their cultural traditions today. And the extraordinary path of one group of Jamaican Maroons, the Maroons of Trelawney Town, which traverses three continents, is an almost forgotten part of history that deserves to be remembered. The first European to visit Jamaica was Christopher Columbus in May 1494 on his second voyage. Columbus had been told of the island while visiting Cuba and received an initially hostile reaction from the local Tayano people. Columbus's first visit was brief, claiming the island for Spain. Columbus visited the island again during his less well-known fourth voyage. During that voyage, his most ambitious, he had explored the South American mainland in hopes of finally finding a passage to the East Indies. Finally, with his ships wearing out and damaged by a storm, the expedition was forced to ground their ships off Jamaica, being marooned. He was able to intimidate the local natives by using a mathematical ephemeris or chart of celestial events, to predict a lunar eclipse in February 1504. After nearly a year on the island and withstanding an internal rebellion, the group was finally rescued in June and returned to Spain. Among the many accolades that Columbus received from the Spanish crown was possession for he and his descendants of the island of Jamaica. But Jamaica wasn't particularly well prized by the Spanish. There was no gold to be found on the island. The first permanent European settlement in Jamaica was established in 1509, settled on the order of Columbus's son, Diego. The colonists fought with and enslaved the indigenous Taino people who were also stricken by disease. The combination of death due to overwork and slaves and disease devastated the Taino numbers, which had been as high as 60,000 when Columbus first visited in 1494. The Spanish started importing black slaves as early as 1513 to make up for the shortage of labor. The first black slaves were likely not imported from Africa, rather they were taken from the Iberian Peninsula. The Reconquista, the Christian reconquest of Iberia, was completed in 1492 in what were then called black slaves from Spain. Black Muslims captured or enslaved during the Reconquista were used as labor in the Spanish colonies as Spain was still recovering and had few resources to purchase African slaves. Almost from the start, black slaves imported to the Americas started escaping, often joining with indigenous peoples to form their own communities. Dr. Sultana Afraz, formerly of the University of the West Indies, notes that the topology and ecology of Jamaica was conducive to their hideouts and establishments, or that is to say, there might have been communities of escaped slaves in the mountains of Jamaica in the early 1500s. Jamaica was largely ignored by the Spanish, never developed by the Columbus family, it was mostly used as a station for supply for Spanish voyages and colonization on the mainland. While the native population was devastated, the Spanish colony was never large. In 1611, the population of the island was reported as 1,510. 588 were listed as black slaves, with another 107 free people of color, people of African or African and European descent who were not enslaved. The census listed just 74 Tayanos. That count would not have included native Taino peoples and escaped slaves living in the island's interior. In 1654, during the period of the English Protectorate, Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell sent a fleet with the goal of capturing Spanish colonies in the West Indies. The so-called Western design was part of the Anglo-Spanish War, a war over competing trade empires as well as a war between Protestant England and Catholic Spain. Cromwell was convinced that it was God's will that Protestantism should prevail and sent a significant English fleet to conquer the Spanish colony on Hispaniola under the command of Admiral William Penn, father of the founder, of Pennsylvania. The so-called Western design, if remembered at all, is usually listed as a fiasco or a disaster. The fleet was supposed to capture the Spanish possession of Hispaniola and use that as a base to disrupt Spanish shipping throughout the Americas. The fleet included 18 warships and 20 transports carrying some 2,500 troops. More troops were gathered from British colonies in the Atlantic, and while that force was of impressive size, the troops were generally untrained, inexperienced, and poorly disciplined. The attack on Santa Domingo, the main Spanish settlement on Hispaniola, was a failure. The inexperienced English troops suffered in the tropical conditions, and the Spanish defenses had been strengthened after war with the Dutch. In 
having suffered several defeats attacking the town, the dejected British decided instead to attack the nearby, much less important and much less well defended, island of Jamaica. Outnumbered, the Spanish largely retreated, but before they did, they let loose their cattle and their slaves. While there are almost certainly some communities of escaped slaves already on Jamaica, it was the British invasion of 1655 that would give rise to the diverse communities of Jamaican Maroons. The etymology of the word Maroon is uncertain, but the most common explanation is that the English word was derived from the Spanish word Cimarron, which was used to refer to feral cattle on Hispaniola. It may have been derived from a Taino word, Cimarabo, meaning roughly fugitive. The term came to be used for fugitive slave communities throughout the New World. The Maroon communities were located in remote and inaccessible areas where they would develop their own culture, leadership, and even languages. There were various groups that were independent of each other, surviving by subsistence farming, occasional raids on plantations, and some limited trade. The groups would sometimes come into conflict with each other as well. At first, the Jamaican Maroons assisted the Spanish in various attempts to retake Jamaica, tended to be highly effective fighters and raiders, having an intimate knowledge of the terrain, and largely owing to the alliance with the Maroons, the Spanish were able to frustrate British attempts to establish control of the island's interior. However, various Spanish attempts to retake the island were defeated. Finally, in 1659, a group of the Maroons decided to switch sides and ally with the British. They helped the British to track down the Spaniards on the island. The Spanish realized they were defeated, largely abandoned the island, and officially ceded it to England in 1670. In exchange, the Maroons that allied with the British were given land rights on an equal basis with British settlers. The British used the island for sugar plantations, a labor-intensive industry for which they imported large amounts of slaves from West Africa. The draw of the Maroons and various slave revolts meant that the Maroon communities were fed by a constant supply of runaway slaves, and the Maroons became roughly divided between the Windward Group on the east side of the Blue Mountains and a Leeward Group to the west. The Maroons would occasionally raid plantations, and there were various conflicts between the Maroons and the British, including campaigns in the 1670s and 80s led by then Lieutenant Governor of the island and notorious privateer Henry Morgan. The conflict between the government and the Maroons slowly grew more heated, and in the 1730s the British made a concerted effort to eradicate the Maroon settlements in order to stop raids on British plantations and facilitate settlement. But the Maroons were skilled warriors, and they knew the territory well. The British were largely frustrated by their effective guerrilla warfare. Although the conflict, which came to be known as the First Maroon War, was costly to the Maroon communities as well. The war was finally settled with a series of treaties, signed in 1739 and 40, that granted the Maroons recognition and land rights. The treaties also obliged the Maroons to assist the British in both fighting uprisings and returning fugitive slaves. It was dissatisfaction over some of the terms of those treaties, as well as heavy-handed British actions. The British were paranoid about a slave revolt following revolts in nearby Santo Domingo that eventually led to the 1795 Second Maroon War. Members of one of the largest of the Maroon communities, Trelawney Town, had a grievance over how a couple of Maroons had been treated over the purported theft of a pig, and the British mishandled the situation and it escalated into open warfare. The Leeward Maroons remained neutral, and some of the Windward Maroons actually supported the British, but despite being outnumbered 10 to 1, the Trelawney Maroons achieved success the way the Maroons always had, using their superior knowledge of the terrain and guerrilla tactics. Despite overwhelming numbers, as many as 5,000 British troops were opposing maybe 500 Maroons, the British were unable to defeat the Maroons and set on a strategy of trying to cut them off from supply. The ongoing conflict caused significant damage to the island's economy, damaged many British plantations. When the British imported 100 bloodhounds from Cuba, the Maroons decided to surrender, but under the agreement that they would not be deported. But the Jamaican governor decided not to respect the terms of the surrender that had been negotiated by the military commander, George Walpole. And much to Walpole's disgust, they decided to deport the Trelawney Maroons. But that began a very bizarre adventure, because not knowing what to do with the Trelawney Maroons, the Jamaican government decided to send them to Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia had a unique legacy. During the Revolutionary War, the British offered escaped slaves freedom if they would join the British Army in the war. Although the policy was inconsistent, escaped slaves were often returned to loyalist masters, many thousands of black Americans fought on the side of the British in the war and were evacuated after the war. Some were sent to London, others to the Caribbean, even Jamaica, and around 4,000 were sent to Nova Scotia, where many loyalist refugees of the revolution were relocated. Thus, the Trelawney Maroons were sent to join the black loyalists in an African community in Canada, arriving in July 1796. 
The transition had not always been smooth for the black loyalists. Competition over jobs led to riots in Shelburne, Nova Scotia in 1784, in which several homes of black loyalists were destroyed. The Shelburne riots are considered to be among the first race riots in North America. For the Trelawney Maroons, whom the Jamaican authorities had sent to Nova Scotia without consulting the Nova Scotia government, not only was there friction with the white community in Nova Scotia, but they had to face unfamiliar climate and culture. The Maroons were given land to farm. Some were put to work on roads and work on the colony's defensive fortification, Halifax Citadel. The British government provided a stipend for a school. The particularly harsh winter of 1796 and 97 convinced many of the Trelawney Maroons that Canada was no place for Jamaicans. In one of their appeals, they argued that the Maroon cannot exist where the pineapple is not. But the government in Jamaica wouldn't allow them to return, and so in August of 1800, the Trelawney Maroons were set on another bizarre voyage, this time to a place called Freetown. Like the Maroons, many of the black loyalists of Nova Scotia had struggled with both the climate and the economic conditions. In the late 18th century, some of the black loyalists of Nova Scotia decided to join a venture to create a colony that Great Britain had established in West Africa. A settlement had been formed in 1787 in order to settle some of the so-called black poor of London, a growing population of a black underclass with a diverse background, but which also included blacks free during the American Revolution. The settlement had struggled, stricken by disease and starvation and conflict with local tribes. In 1792, some 1,200 of the black loyalists from Nova Scotia had chosen to give up on Canadian winters and take their chances in the settlement in West Africa. While they had built a successful settlement, life was still challenging and growing tension arose of the lack of supplies from Britain and a system of taxation that kept settlers perpetually in debt. The colony had gone into rebellion, purportedly under the leadership of a slave who had formerly been owned by George Washington. When the Trelawney Maroons arrived in May of 1800, in an ironic twist, the British employed the Maroons to put down the rebellion. In exchange for putting down the revolt, the Trelawney Maroons were given the best land and houses, and today their descendants are part of the Sierra Leone Creole culture. Their bizarre track to be enslaved in West Africa, sent to Jamaica to work on a plantation, escaped to the Jamaican mountains to become a Maroon, only to be deported to Canada and then sent back to West Africa, is symbolic of the deprivations and cultural shock that came with the victims of the Atlantic slave trade. And the fact that they were used to put down a revolt of other free blacks from the Americas shows they're both their own divided loyalties and their complex history. And in another bizarre twist, when in 1833 the British passed a law that largely banned slavery throughout the empire, the sugar plantations in Jamaica faced a labor shortage, and some of the descendants of the Trelawney Maroons in Sierra Leone relocated back to Jamaica in order to work those plantations. And they have grouped up to live in a town called Flagstaff, which is very near the original location of Trelawney Town. Today, the Jamaican Maroons are a semi-autonomous cultural group that still lives on land that was granted to them in the treaties after the First Maroon War in 1740. And their unique culture, a mixture of African, European, and American, continues to impact societies on both sides of the Atlantic. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.